Thank you so much, David, for that uh, that welcome um, and uh, your kind words about the things that I've been up to um, over the. I mean, for most of my um, my artistic life has been very much um, community based. Um, coming to Launceston was something that that um, gave me this amazing connection to the community, and there are some faces that I recognise, um, you know, that are, that are here today, which is wonderful. Um, I'd like to start by also acknowledging the traditional and original custodians of the land in which we gather today. The Stony Creek Nation, made up of at least three clans, lived along the riverways in harmony with the seasons for several thousand generations. And today we are remembering, uh, they remember them as our traditional custodians and owners of the land. We celebrate the stories, culture and traditions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders of all communities who also work and live on this land. Um, I'd also um, like to start by, uh, by dedicating this talk to Chris Donaldson. Um, Chris Donaldson was somebody who passed away quite recently and he was a passionate collector and part of the community of Deloraine um, that kind of that, um, takes on this tradition of Jimmy Possum um, chairs and, make, and, and bush carpentry. Um, he was just an amazing man, so um, I wanted to dedicate the talk to him. I also like to thank the Royal Society um, and, uh, and everyone for being able to invite me to present the annual lecture for QB Mag. Um, today I'll be talking about bush carpentry and more specifically Jimmy Possum and the future actually of um, the tradition in Northern Tasmania is the ongoing and unbroken tradition that has been going for over 150 years um, and continues to be going strong. So, um, let me grab my little pointer here. Yeah, da, da, da. Okay. Oh, yeah, let's see, here we go. Okay, so I think that the most important thing to, to really kind of talk about um, is a question that you want to get out of the way pretty much early on. Um, and, and this is about the person that um, the tradition is associated with and named after, the mysterious maker um, called Jimmy Possum, who gave us a unique design that remains with us to this day. Possum lived within the hollow of a giant tree, as so told, um, um, or as they say, um, because amongst uh, nothing about Jimmy Possum is certain, aside from knowing he lived in the Meander Valley in the late 19th century, um, and was the maker of a unique chair found there. We know that uh, Geelong artist um, Laura Davy visited and painted a series of watercolour postcards during, the, during this early time when Jimmy Possum was active. And this one here, it captures a man known as Jimmy Possum living inside the hollow of a tree. The Jimmy Possum configuration um, is something that makes the makes the make makes the um, the furniture something that is actually really quite unique um, and does not appear anywhere else in the world, suggesting that Northern Tasmanian chair making tradition is un is a unique Australian innovation. We can confidently say that the Jimmy po the Jimmy Possum inspired and perhaps shared skills with subsequent chair makers from the Meander Valley in Northern Tasmania, which we'll talk which I'll talk about later on. So. Um, you can see the configuration. Oh, let's see how this would be works here. Um, the configuration here, where um, the 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 arms, um, you've got the front legs that go through the seat, and you've actually got the the um, the rungs at the back going into the seat, um, so that you've got this design where it's all kind of held together, and there's nothing else to to um to give reference to a chair made like this anywhere else in the world than than the chairs made. Uh, by Jimmy Possum and then the subsequent makers. Um, so um, let's. Uh, so this animation that was. Oh, hang on. Um, yeah, I, here we go. Um, this animation that was done for the exhibition that is having a little bit of a glitch here um, actually shows um, the way that the chair kind of goes together and comes apart. Um,
So it's going to have some fun doing that. <laughs> anyway, anyway, look, the, the more, the more, there we go, there we go. So you can see, see kind of the, 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 um, the pieces and how they kind of go together. Um, but as we get through this, you'll all become experts on the, on the Jimmy Possum tradition and all of the chairs that were made. So we can kind of, we can move on from that. So the, the let's, I just really want to go back a step um, and talk about bush carpentry. So we define bush carpentry and its links to makers like Jimmy Possum um, as something that is divine by being in the bush and being kind of somewhere close to materials. This research can, research can be split into needs, materials, tools and skill. Regardless of whether the furniture made in the Meander region was a Jimmy Possum design, all furniture made in this region um, had to be more of a make-do kind of philosophy around um, doing the best with what you had on hand. This is best re represented by the Green Hill chairs, which will I'll show you very soon. The next link is the materials. Most are made from green wood, so timber that is grown on the property or not too far away from the place of making. The tools that we will look at next were a very simple set of tools that could be easy to carry and use without the skills learned to use more specific carpentry skills or cabinet making. In the book published in 1978 that, um, that David um, was talking about, um, uh, published by uh, Michael McWilliams, Mary DeFore, Jenny Sharp and David Thorpe, um, Adam Thorpe rather, visited and interviewed many of the makers and related families to conclude that the furniture of the region was about necessity, about some social fabric um, that was important for these chairs, being where necessity was the mother invention, and that these makers were self-taught, they made their own rules and methods, um, and were, they were infused by English and Irish chairs. So looking at the, it's important to look at the tools and exactly what was used to make these chairs. So these images are from the book um, that uh, David was talking about that was researched as part of kind of like an education um, uh, degree. So what we actually have here is we have a chair that actually ended up being in the exhibition of a McMahon chair, um, stools that were made at a similar time, and then you've got these other chairs that, um, you've got one that is very much a Windsor chair turning into a Jimmy Possum chair, and then these chairs here that were kind of they were called stick chairs back then. And we've been able to kind of like to say it's a Jimmy Possum tradition um, rather than actually saying that these are stick chairs because stick chairs are kind of like Welsh chairs as well, which we'll kind of talk about as well in the next next little while. So um, the tools of, um, of the tradition are very rudimentary. There's only kind of like a few tools that would all be tools that would be used in a farming context um, that would be used to, um, to create um, the furniture that's part of the tradition. The first one would be a broad axe. Um, so a broad axe would be something that would be on every um, um, country property for, for, uh, for cutting up timber. Um, and this would be used uh, very much to kind of to split timber um, and for cutting, cutting trees as well as using a saw to be able to then actually have, have the right type of timber um, that was not free and it um, could be split. The most important thing about these chairs, they're not made with sticks, even though they're called stick chairs. They are kind of, they're split timber that are then, then refined. Part of that refining is, use, is using, using this, this um, um, piece, piece of toolware um, that is then kind of used on a log to then create billets. So this is this kind of, this action here. So then you're actually creating all of these split timbers that can then be refined. And then the as was the was the, the tool another tool that was kind of was very much part of a, a farming um, a context, um, and as you can see in this slide here in here this is what it was doing it was actually kind of carving out the seat, um, and in this image here you can actually see somebody that is actually making a Windsor chair with an as so there's a lot of the 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 tools that are used in Windsor chairs and. Uh, chairs in Scotland and Wales were made with the same, the, the, the same tools. The most important tool um, that for making these chairs is a draw knife. 
So um, it's just a very, very simple tool to use. This is um, Mike Epworth um, using um, a, a draw knife. Um, and most all of the, um, when the components are then split and they're ready to put together, a draw knife would be how you refine those pieces. So even this chair here, you'd actually find that there's kind of, there's tool marks that would be very much about a draw knife making those components. And then to make holes that were part of kind of like putting those, those pieces together um, would be mostly at the time they were hand augers. Um, um, but the auger bit is the thing that's most important. So later it would become a brazen bit. Um, some, some modern makers actually use hand drills to do those kinds of things, but um, the auger is the thing that I used when I was actually trying to make a chair myself, and it is actually you know, quite uh, an amazing tool to use when sharp. The other thing that's really interesting to be able to talk about when it comes to the Jimmy Possum tradition um, is, let me find my page here, um, is, is where the tradition kind of comes from, the region and the places of interest. So the Meander Valley is kind of, is pretty much where, where it sits. So you've got an area where chairs were made from Reedy Marsh, which is where the Larkhams were, Elizabethtown, where you found kind of chairs um, on, you know, um, in pubs and pubs around that area. Um, and then you had Deloraine, uh, Westbury, and that kind of area. So I'll put a rudimentary ring around that to say that that's kind of the region where all these chairs were made. When you actually kind of like look at it from the context of the, of the state, it's actually really quite small. So when actually looking at, um, at this um, from, the, from the relationship of Australian cottage chairs and vernacular furniture of, um, of a place like Australia, it's really quite small. When you then compare it to chairs that are associated with other countries, like the, um, the, English, the English Windsor chair, which is very much across um, southern England, um, and the American Shaker chair, which is very much kind of like a widespread tradition, it's really important to say that these chairs and this design only just happened here. Um, that, um, that most of the chairs that were part of the exhibition that we had here a couple of years ago all came from this area. So that's really quite extraordinary to say that, some, that a, a tradition kind of came from such a small, a small place. So one of the historic images to be able to have a look at where, where some of these things were happening at this time um, is looking at the, uh, the Sattler's Arms. Um, this early photograph, actually you can see, you can see there's two Jimmy Possum chairs. There's one, one here, and then there's another one over here. So this, um, this, this building was built in 1862 by convict John Spicer. It became a popular coaching, sp coaching spot on the way from Launceston to the northwest coast. After, after John's death, the Sattler Arms was sold to his son-in-law, Charles Sattler, who built and present and the, who built the present building, which, is no, which was known as the Sattler's Hotel in 1904. It later became known as the Elizabeth Town Hotel and now remains the popular stopping off point on the way to the northwest coast called the Elizabeth Town Cafe, ETC. If, you've, if, you, if you're along that road heading to Devonport, that building, the original building, that was the building that people were stopping off at back in the day of Jimmy Possum. We know now of this, the, of the fact of that he frequented these kinds of places in Elizabethtown, Westbury and Deloraine, and that there were chairs at that time. So these are part of the, the fabric of, of finding out exactly where these things kind of happened. So one of the things that is really interesting, it's nice to see Ross Smith in the audience here today. Um, because um, this image here is one of the images that is really quite interesting. Um, it's an Im we don't know we don't know about the subjects that are in this this portrait uh, that is held in the history collection here at QB Mag. But however, we do know that it was taken at a time where these chairs were made. Um, and however, um, the photographer and, and the photographer would have actually used these perhaps as props to be able to have people to sit in. So we know that there are still some mysteries to be found, um, which is kind of really, really quite interesting. So when we're actually thinking about the Jimmy Possum chairs and 
um, and and the most the seminal book, one of the seminal books, is the 1978 book that David was talking about. The other the other book um, is the catalogue and history of cottage chairs, um, which is one of the one where many of the chairs that were part of the exhibition and that are part of collections, not just ours but collections at Sovereign Hill in Victoria, um, have some of these amazing chairs. This chair is identified as a Jimmy Possum dining chair. Um, and was built at the same time and is something that is actually in the collection at Sovereign Hill. At the moment, Dr Epworth, who I'll talk about in a little while, is trying to put together an exhibition at the Design Centre um, that will happen some, somewhere down the track. I think they're very keen on doing it, where he's going to try to get those chairs from Sovereign Hill that are not on display, that are actually that are in their, their storage areas for their furniture, get them back down here. Um, to be shown um, with the idea that um, we can maybe um, encourage Sovereign Hill to have them donated to an institution like QBMAC. Um, so that's kind of like in the pipeline, but this chair is really quite an amazing um, um, way of looking at, looking at these chairs. So let's jump into the chairs themselves. So um, when, we put the, when we went to say that we wanted to do this Jimmy Possum exhibition, um, and Mike Epworth was the person that knew a lot about the chairs that were, that were available. I knew a lot about the chairs that were available at other institutions. Um, and then we really decided that we would um, invest as much time as possible in trying to get as many chairs as possible and not compromise on how many chairs we could get. Only one chair we didn't get, which is a, a, a pink, pink and white um, painted chair. Oh, the computer's restarting. <laughs> we'll just take, it to take, take a short break. But I can still, I can, I can keep on talking. Um, so the significance of the chairs that we wanted to have in the exhibition was that, you know, that they the, and you'll go through these um, once we're back online, um, the significance of these chairs uh, were that it wasn't so much about, everyone talks about Jimmy Possum and they only want to talk about Jimmy Possum. But Jimmy Possum started something that became a tradition, became something that was kind of bigger than its parts. So that we can thank him for the way that we uh, look at a tradition and a design of a chair. But then everyone that came after that is actually, they're the ones that have continued the tradition, made sure that it kind of kept on going throughout the years until this very day where chairs are still being made as an unbroken tradition. So that we can then, we can, in that exhibition, we weren't just looking at Jimmy Possum. It would be a very short story. There's a mysterious man was Jimmy Possum. He made a chair and then that was it. But what we can do with this, thank you, Mel. Um, what we can do with an exhibition like, um, like QD Mag exhibition is be able to compare chairs and be able to then look at how the lineage of these chairs kind of grew over time. The most significant chairs that are part of this tradition, um, this chair actually is included in that now, and I'll talk about that in a little while, um, are, are these chairs. So the Red Hill chair um, and Richie's chair, they're chairs that are part of the, um, the Folk Museum um, in Deloraine. Um, please go there and have a look. Their collection of, of Jimmy Possum chairs, given the, you know, the, their connection to the region, um, is, um, is really an important um, place to look at Jimmy Possum chairs. So please have a look at those. A lot of these were lent from them. The Narina House chairs, they're two chairs that, are, that were made at the same time, we know that. Um, they're painted the same colour and they were collected at the same time by Narina House in, um, in, in Hobart. So they're really important as well. The thing about these chairs, uh, we've been to be, when they're in the one place, we're actually able to compare them. So um, Dr Epworth and I, we we compared these chairs, we had them next to each other, we were doing measurements between rungs and all of these really nerdy things with chairs. But it was really important for us to be able to say, okay, um, when we have a look at Larkham chairs, they're going to be things that are going to be um, very close to the tradition of Jimmy Possum, but how do they differ and how, do, how are they close? And how were those skills kind of imparted? So the oral histories that are around, and they're the only thing we have as oral histories, they give us an insight into the personal and working life of Jimmy Possum. These, these stories attached 
to two chairs in particular, the Red Hill Chair and the Richie's Chair, are really quite interesting when looking at how these stories have been handed down through several generations of, um, of a family that lived in the Delran district. Um, the components are well made in the Richie's Chair, um, the posture is well formed, um, and, it's, a, and it's, it's one of the best examples of, um, of a Jimmy Possum chair. The Red Hill chair, in, in comparison, which is connected to the, a hotel located a short distance from where Jimmy Possum is said to have lived in a hollow tree, um, is by contrast quite rickety and not as well made. The Richie's chair oral history has Jimmy Possum on a family farm, presumably during winter, where he could be employed as a woodcutter. Uh, to fuel steam engines that ran farming equipment. His occupation would have, this occupation would have allowed Jimmy Possum to work inside with a bench and a warm place. Um, there are several stories of families swapping meagre accommodation on their farm for a chair, but none with as such oral histories connected to them as the Richie's chair. Farmers at the time were also wary of, of um, drinkers. Uh, generally, the farms were dry for, of alcohol. If there is anything to be gleaned from the stories attached to be possum, is that he was rather keen on the grog. Um, and the Red Hills Inn, according to local stories, was where he swapped his chairs for alcohol. On the, so the Red Hill chair has a bit more of a sloppy construction. May have been uh, at a warmer time of the year, and perhaps a time when he was kind of, he was a little bit more kind of prone to drinking. And they're very, very different chairs in their, in their construction. While many of the uh, significant chairs that, that um, you know, are around the region, uh, like I said, most of them actually are connected to, to the Folk Museum. Um, so we can actually see um, that this is the Richie's chair that is <coughs> off to the side here. Um, that's all right. Um, let's go back one. Okay, and um, and then there's there's the lady that's doing just doing the um, the the spinning, and she's sitting in a Jimmy Possum chair as well with that amazing hairdo. <laughs> um, so we know that kind of like even back then, that kind of like places like um, these these would have been chairs that I think people would have been using. Um, so that now we're looking at them as, as museum pieces. I brought this chair in here wearing black black nitrine gloves because it's now a museum piece and no one sits in this by the way. Um, so that's so that's kind of kind of it. But that chair there, people would have sat in it. This lady here, she's sitting in there looking after the museum. So now some of the chairs that are really quite interesting. These chairs um, are some of my favourites because they do kind of um, feed into that make-do uh, tradition of chair making. The thing about the, um, the Green Hill chairs um, is that they were made at a similar time um, to when Jimmy Possum was active, so in the 1880s. So, um, wait a um, so these three chairs, they were made um, by George Green Hill. The great thing about this is we actually have records that substantiate when he made them, um, when he made at least one of them. Um, and they are the tradition's earliest documented chairs because of the time they were made. But you can see that these aren't made with green timbers, they're actually kind of like made more with recycled materials we found on a farm. One of the three chairs, um, which is uh, this one here, the little, the little thing is working. Okay, so the one that's off to the side. The one that's off to the side there that actually looks like it has some kind of a, you know, it has six legs. Um, this six-legged chair um, was made by George at a time when he was recently married. And the things that we, we kind of, we add in some of our own, our own thoughts and our own motivations towards why things happen um, in social fabric like this. And we kind of think that maybe his new wife saw the chair and George's disappointment in it not kind of like working out because it would have fallen backwards. Um, and he insisted that it wouldn't be discarded, it should be, that it should be remedied and fixed. So hence there's an extra set of legs that, place, that, are, that are placed at the seat's back to brace the chair so the chair doesn't fall over. This story was collected by um, Dr Mike Epworth during the research to attest 
So Jimmy Possum's tradition, social and cultural importance, and how it is connected to the landscape and the people of Meander Valley. Because when we actually have a look, um, this is a painting that is, and I've cut and pasted this, I've cut this out and I've got my pointer there. So that little point, pointer there is me cut, cutting it out of the computer and the cursor being there. That white arrow was not there back in 1839. <laughs> um, so this actually is, so the house on the hill is that is Egmont, which is the, the house that the Green Hills lived in. Um, the Green Hills family have moved since moved from there, but this was the site where, when they were there, this is where the, the chairs were made. The painting dates to 1839. Um, and it shows the river and the possible locations where Jimmy Possum lived at some stage, um, you know, working with... So along this river here, there's some dwellings and there's areas there where it's kind of, it's foretold that he may have lived. And he did move around and do lots of work for different families. So, um, and it's believed that he also... So we're thinking that wherever Jimmy Possum was, he was imparting the design aesthetic that is part of the chairs themselves, because they're all Jimmy Possum style chairs, um, imparted the ideas behind this to people as he went along. So that, um, that the other, and the other family that we'll get to very soon is the Larkhams. This is the document that tells us um, exactly about the chairs themselves. This is the f a farm journal from 1886, um, that is the George Greenhill um, farm journal. There is a, is a um, it's part way through um, the, the journal on this page where he's put um, in the pages of the journal, he said, he announces, wet day, made cheerful wife, white sow had eight piglets. <laughs> so we, know, we also know that a chair's not made in a day. So we think that he kind of maybe was working on the chair, wet days like this, he was actually kind of like, he was maybe finishing things off, but to say that he made a chair in a day probably doesn't work, but he probably finished the chair off on that day. So it's great that we've got these little things that kind of start to fill in the gaps and give us some, 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 um, some context around what's actually happening in different areas of, um, of Deloraine and the district. One of the, some of the most important chairs um, that can be, that kind of, that can be dated to a time of Jimmy Possum and when he was active, are the chairs that are made by the Larkham family. Um, in, and in particular, William Larkham, which is the second chair in. So because you've got kind of histories of families in the region, so we're thinking that there's, that the close proportions of timber and the construction of this chair, when we compare them together with the Richie's chair, which is the one that he made when he wasn't wasn't on the on the on the the booze, um, they were they're very very similar to look at. When you look at them and when you measure the proportions and you look at where the legs are and you look at some of the the, the tool making, it's, it's a little bit different, but it seems it's very much an identical kind of thing where. You don't have photography, so it may have been that uh, drawing was made, and then from that drawing, um, new chairs were made by William Larkham during that time. And then the Larkham family being a bigger family, then that tradition got passed on to other members of the family. So the exhibition allowed to have these chairs together and have a close comparison. Several generations of the Larkhams, they lived in the Reedy Marsh area, a district close to Deloraine and they made chairs that are import, very important to the tradition. Um, William Larkin was born in 1862, so he was the right age in the 1880s to be able to learn how to, how to make these chairs. And according to local stories, the, um, the family invited Jimmy Possum to stay on their farm. It was owned by his brother Samuel. This story only strengthens the similarities between the chairs that were made by Jimmy Possum and those that were made by William Larkin. They, are, they have the same tool marks and the minor details that both kind of share, as I said before. The exhibition was fortunate to, to loan a William Larkham chair that we didn't really know that existed. Um, and this Larkham chair was an amazing kind of find um, to loan, uh, which is the Larkham chair that is pictured second in. Um, Mike Epworth calls this chair the Rosetta Stone of, um, of Jimmy Possum chairs used to determine via very subtle differences that um, William Larkin and, Jimmy, and that William Larkin was taught to make 
these chairs by Jimmy Possum himself. Other members of the family followed um, William's footsteps in making chairs. Brothers George and Samuel, his nephew Keith, Arthur and Roy, um, and their great enough nephew um, uh, Jeff all made chairs. These makers incorporated uh, different shaped components such as flat rungs that we can see in, in Jeff's chair as well as Roy's chair for a little bit of extra comfort. Um, some of them actually had, had eight-sided tent post shaped legs um, and used local timbers such as blackwood and peppergum even though Jeff's uh, amazing 1970s chair, which is this one here, was made from heavy iron bark. This chair is an absolute gargantuan thing. Um, it, it takes two people to pick it up because it's made, made out of solid, solid iron bark. So this image that was taken during the time when, um, when the, the folks that were, 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 in, were in Hobart and they were researching and doing an exhibition about the chairs, um, this, this photograph was taken of Mavis Keith and Roy Larkham. Um, so I know it's kind of staged, I think, maybe for the book, but it's really important to be able to have a look at this and to see that you've got um, the two chairs made by Roy and Keith Larkham. Um, you've got Roy Larkham holding a draw knife in his hand on the, um, and then on the, the, um, the wall of the, of the dwelling, you've got an as, and you've got a broad, a, a broad uh, axe behind, and there's, there's a nice little, little cursor as well that I've copied again. <laughs> so you can actually see kind of like the tools that they, were, that they were making, and then you've got the example of these two chairs. These ones, we don't actually know. We can look at them and try to find out where they might be, and we don't know where these two chairs are. The next kind of um, lot of chairs to have a look at are the chairs that were made by the McMahon family. Now, this is kind of really interesting. The McMahons live next door to the Larkhams. So this was kind of one of those things where, um, where you know, another skill was kind of like passed on. So now we're kind of like jumping to the skill of making chairs going from the Larkhams to the McMahon family. So the McMahons had a different aesthetic to their chairs. So they weren't using green timbers they were actually being very similar to their Green Hill chairs and they were making, making their chairs out of recycled timbers. So you've actually got flat slats, you've got um, five rungs, but you can actually see with these chairs that they're a bit more decorative. They've got a swooping back um, arms with decorative ends here on one of them. Um, and you've got these, um, they're called moustache backs um, at the back of them um, to make them, make them more decorative. But, the tradition and the design is still exactly the same, except for the back of the chairs, where the two flat runs, they actually kind of go all the way down, but they don't go through the arm. The arm kind of stops at the rung. That's the only difference other than that. Um, and they, um, and there's, and we know that um, there's a similar unpainted chair that was included in that seminal book, um, The Catalogue and History of Cottage Chairs in Australia. The next chair to talk about is a single chair, um, and one of the ones is actually important for how it actually kind of crosses over into different chair making. And this was a chair made by Michael King. The thing about this chair that is really important is the only one that we can date specifically because he's um, he's got his name, um, the date of 1905, and the and Deloraine carved into the base. So. And unusually, this is actually made out of Douglas fir, so it's a timber that actually isn't kind of a timber that was, that was found on the property. It's timber that he got from somewhere else to make the chair. It's got, also got six rungs, so Jimmy Possum chairs that are traditionally five rungs are uncomfortable because the middle rung goes right up your back, whereas this one actually kind of like gives you that comfort where you can kind of like sit your, sit your vertebrae kind of like right in the middle of it. Um, and there's this, and it suggests that King um, also kind of like had um, some sort of, um, of connection to the McMahons. Um, there's like a link there because you've got this same moustached kind of chair, but it's actually more refined than actually just being a flat piece of timber that actually had the, had the, the moustache shape cut out of it. It's actually been refined um, and, the, and the arms also are refined and it's got this, this cherry kind of um, 
and the, the seat is also quite refined. There's a lot more comfort involved in this than some of the earlier chairs. So, um, and also I think it's really important to also talk about um, this chair and then we're going to get into later chairs and then chairs that find what the tradition is now. This chair was made by Michael Cook, who briefly lived in Deloraine in the district before he moved to the northwest coast near Alveston. This chair is much larger than, than a lot of the other ones. It's a real throne and it's one of my favourite chairs in the exhibition. It was wonderful. Like King's, it has six rungs for extra comfort. Um, it's also using the same tools, but it's more refined than all of the other makers. Its components almost have a machine-like quality. This, I mean, this chair, you can tell that it's been used, they used a draw knife, but the person that made it, I think had, it was a bit, it's a bit later, and I think the person that made this actually had a lot more kind of, a, a greater skill set for, for making chairs, and it is a beautiful chair. It is um, loaned by Michael McWilliams. So Michael McWilliams is a key, was a key contributor to the, to the tradition and to keeping these chairs um, and to lining chairs to us, including this chair. Um, the story behind this chair is actually quite lovely because his partner kind of like uh, remembered this chair from when he was, he's a young man. Um, and then, you know, over, over at, um, in the McWilliams camp, um, McWilliams parents were, um, were people that were into antiques and they said to, uh, to Michael, um, you can, for your 21st, you can have a birthday party with your friends or you can have this Jimmy Possum chair that we've, we're going to buy at auction. Well, he bought the chair. That chair was the chair that was taken away from his partner's, partner's house with much disgust. And then he found out later, later in life that when they got together and he looked into, into Michael's house and said, oh, I know that chair. That's the chair that was around when I was younger. So this chair ends up becoming kind of like something of a love seat for me um, and having something really, really kind of like amazing about the fabric, about how these chairs can move around. Um, and it's just so well made, it's a beautiful chair. Um, so as well as the contribution that Michael McWilliams made to this kind of, to things like this, that is, is, is his artwork. Um, this is a large painting. The painting is probably maybe half the size of this screen we're on. Well, it's getting close to being, being you know, as big. Um, and what it does in this, in this image, uh, in this painting, that we're actually able to, um, to, to loan from, from uh, somebody in Hobart, it puts the chair front and centre, iconic and monumental in scale, looking down over kind of the, the landscape and the place of its birth. So, this and these and these um, prints, these were done at a similar time while he was actually kind of researching the book in 1978 with his sister and um, one of the Jimmy Possum chairs um, kind of like in this barbed wire enclosure. So these are prints um, from 1978. So they kind of, they fit in with that tradition as well in art making, which is very important to me that there is actually this artistic you know, kind of tradition as well as a historic tra tradition to these chairs. Um, seeing as this now is, a, is an art piece, this is not a piece of furniture, it's something that people can look at and they can understand the artistry behind the design of, because um, there is, I'm the curator of visual art and design, and the design of things is something that's often missed out on, and it's really important. So um, the other, the person to talk about really um, is this important, um, and I need to mention in respect of the hard work that Dr. Mike Epworth and his partner, Abramon Harm, have done in, in uh, bringing a greater focus to this. Um, we had the 1978 book to be able to kind of reference. If it wasn't for Michael um, and the other three that actually that, um, contributed to that, that book, um, we would have missed out on so much. And the tradition would have, would have definitely been lost to time. Um, they have been able to gather facts, stories and chairs themselves um, that would remain undiscovered if it wasn't for, for, for them kind of contributing and researching it. Um, the continued research now and QV Mag, the QVMAG exhibition and publication has allowed for the ongoing research to happen and for QVMAG to position itself as an important location for many of these chairs to be kept for future generations to enjoy. We are the northern, we are the northern institution and we're closest to it, um, and it's really, really important that we kind of keep that tradition going. 
So this is um, kind of um, Mike at the um, Delaware Craft Fair, kind of like um, showing people how Jimmy Possum chairs are made. Um, and this is, um, is one of his chairs in detail um, that actually you can see that actually has this curved set of rungs and is, um, is amazingly comfortable. So um, it would be the important thing that I wanted to kind of add to this is where the influences are. Where did, where did the kind of the, um, the Jimmy Possum chair kind of come from? And so it's important to talk about in its origins and influences. So what you've got across here is you've got Windsor chairs and you've got um, the two middle ones there, Welsh chairs, and the outside ones are um, uh, Windsor chairs, early Windsor chairs. So when you're actually having a look at them, you can actually, all of a sudden, it's a Gibson chair, the one that's in the dark image, um, and the other ones are kind of uh, more comb-back chairs. You can see how these chairs would have actually kind of like become the most important part in, uh, in something that could influence a Jimmy Possum chair after seeing these chairs. So um, the best, so first we'd actually look at the, the Windsor chair. So the chair, um, so these are early photographs um, in England. The chair is best known and has a longer history developed in the 18th century um, and called stick furniture um, by, villi by villagers that, were, that had wood turners and shipwrights. The Windsor would have, would have been the furniture brought to Australia um, as solid, cottage chairs in early settlements and farms. With its rungs um, and back heavy slab, we can see how this chair could have contributed to the first two possum pieces. The first use of the term Windsor as a chair was first kind of coined by the wife of Lord Percival in 1724. Then later in 1727, a chair maker, John Brown, advertised the production of comb back chairs in many sizes and many um, either unpainted or painted green. And many Jimmy Possum chairs are painted green over and above any other colour if they're painted, which is what we could actually kind of like, you know, attribute to the history of Windsor chairs. The best, the, the, the area best known for chair making in England is, um, is just north of High Wycombe in the Chilterns, um, in the hills there, where beech wood was cut and prepared by what they call bodgers, um, to make Windsor chairs. Uh, in this image, this image here, which is amazing, I just love this image. This image is kind of like shows the pride in the industry of chair making um, and was built um, over the main street of High Wycombe um, in, in 1880 for the, for the visit of the Prince of Wales, who would later become King Edward, King Edward VII. This is from a BBC, this, this image, these images here. Um, oh, hang on, I've gone too far now. Oh, hang on, I don't want to do that. Da, da, da. Okay, there we go. Um, these images um, are here are, are from a 1950s uh, documentary um, um, that shows these, what they're called the chair watches um, at the Chilterns, uh, where they're preparing all the billets um, to then be going into High Wycombe to then be able to be made into chairs. So the other, the other chairs to have a look at are Welsh hedge chairs. And you can actually see where the Welsh hedge chairs, hedge chairs are, are very much um, heading towards the tradition of Jimmy Possum. My feeling is that these are the chairs that actually that would have been made um, during the time of Jimmy Possum. Um, and they also are chairs that originate back in the 18th century. So there's a, a good deal that we actually have this tradition morphing into morphing into something where you've actually got down here, you've got the arm going through and it keeps on going. And then how, how easy is it to then say, it'd be much easier to actually have that as one piece going all the way through. So they're the things that kind of give us these kind of clues. That's where history is so exciting and fun. So the hedge chairs derive its name from, uh, from the chairs being made by hedge school teachers. So this is due to the English authorities banning education by um, Irish Catholics. So Irish teachers then set up um, illegal schools hidden by hedges. In the middle of the 19th century, the Great Famine afflicted, that afflicted Ireland sent many millions of, um, of Irish um, immigrants to, um, to Australia. In Tasmania, many of these refugees ended up living in the outskirts of Deloraine. 
So we know, and we've got, we've got Irish towns, some of these areas that are very much kind of kind of connected to the Irish coming to uh, to, to Tasmania. The Gibson chair. Um, this one uh, was don't. This one on this side was made by um, a man out in Deloraine, Geoffrey Giles, um, and provides an example of the English English uh, the Irish chairs configuration. At the time of the exhibition, QV Mag had only one chair in the collection that is not related to, to Jimmy Possum, even though some people called it a Jimmy Possum chair um, incorrectly before, before I came along and, uh, and Mike was able to say that he isn't a Jimmy Possum chair. So this chair, which is the chair, the second one in, um, Mike coined the term the anomaly chair because it does have some attributes of the Jimmy Possum chair. It's on its way to becoming a Jimmy Possum chair, but no cigar. Its, it's uh, front legs do come through the seat, but the back legs don't. It does have five rungs, and the side rungs do go through the arms. So there's only just a whisker away from being a Jimmy Possum chair. So that's, even though we didn't have a, that was the only Jimmy Possum style kind of chair we had in our collection at the time, this chair actually becomes one of the most important chairs that is held by a collection because it actually shows a morphing between a, a, um, a Welsh chair and a Jimmy Possum chair. It's only one, one factor away from it. Um, so that's why these things are important to collect. So the image off to the side was part of the 1978 book that, that at the time that wasn't held in our collection. Now it is held in our collection and we can actually show how important this is to the tradition. The chair next to that um, is a, a chair made by the Larkin family and it's, a, it's one of the rare ones that has, has flat slats and only four of them also to eliminate that middle slat. This chair was also um, privately owned and now that's part of the TMAG collection in Hobart. So this is kind of such an important kind of thing to understand how QV Mag and people like, um, like um, Mike Epworth and people that are looking out for chairs make, this, make these things happen. Um, so it's important now to say that kind of like, you know, that um, the chair that you have here um, is one of three, was one of three um, that were purchased by Diana Cameron, who's very well known to QV Mag in the 1970s in Deloraine. Um, this one's his, one of them is his, is lost to history. Um, the second one that we know is actually is held in the, the the furniture collection of the National Gallery in Canberra, um, and then this one has been recently acquired. Like on Friday, I picked this up um, after after kind of after acquiring it. A long process of acquisition that we do at QB Mag um, for me to kind of write a proposal to say how important this chair is, and then to be able to acquire it. And um, on my day off, I went out and picked this chair up so that we could have an example today. So this is, even though it's an old chair, it's fresh to the collection. Um, so, and we, we know that this can be attributed to Jim Possum. Um, so it's, it's such an important chair. So that kind of is increasing our, our collection now in a really lovely way. So what's the future of the tradition? Um, and something that we didn't really hit on too much in the exhibition that I wanted to kind of draw out a little bit in this lecture. Um, it's important to reinforce that this tradition is not dead, it's ongoing. Jimmy Possum started it, but that's something that is kind of, that has just rolled on through time, through people like the Larkhams and McMahons, um, different generations of the Larkhams, um, and somebody like Mike Epworth. Even if I make a chair, which I'm in the throes of making, um, a Jimmy Blossom style chair, made out of timbers that are important to me and my family, that's me being part of that tradition, being part of something that I might teach to, um, to somebody who's part of my family, and then they make a Jimmy Blossom chair. That's what we're talking about with this tradition. To be able to push it forward and say that we're saying that this chair is, could be the Australian chair that the, I, I talked about the Windsor chair and the Shaker chair, those chairs that are important to regions of different parts of the world. Um, we don't have that. We have chairs that are derived from different parts of the world that become something that we have in Australia. This has a cottage chair and the, the configuration and the design of it is different to everything else that we've kind of, that I've kind of established. 
Um, so now we can actually make claim to saying that this is, is the national Australian chair. Um, so it's a big thing to say in a, little, in a little place in Tasmania, but I think we can. So these are the Tasmanians that are pushing the tradition further. Um, we've got um, Matt Holden uh, and um, Matthew Sims, Mike Epworth and John, John Grant. Um, so this, this demonstrates the work, this, um, we go to Matthew Sims. So Matthew Sims um, and Mike Epworth are the two people artisans that were very much part of the part of the, the tradition of um, of what we wanted as like makers that were still making their work when we had the exhibition. So G Matthew Sims is very much contemporary Jimmy Possum. I mean, this is a man who who um, lives very very meagerly, um, and his approach to um, he lives in an open field in the outskirts of Westbury. Um, very near to where Jimmy Possum lived over a century before. Matthew has no power. He sources, sources timber from his surroundings using the same old techniques, draw knives, as is all of those, those, um, those tools uh, in his chair making. Many would have seen him selling his beautiful dolls and paintings or playing many old world and amazing instruments like hurdy-gurdies at the Evendale market. Um, like a majority of, his, of historic makers, he uses green wood. So he's going back to Tasmania where he's, he's um, using green wood and then letting that dry, which then kind of, it does tighten up the joints, but it also um, makes it a little bit twisted and, and a bit of fun, those chairs. And we have one of those chairs in our collection now that we purchased before the exhibition happened, so which is fantastic. Um, he, um, he is, is the, the chair off to one side there is the chair that he kind of lived in or lives in where it's got a uh, wing back um, and it's an old washboard that it was, was donated to him which is the back of it. It's a, and so it's an old Jimmy Possum chair that he's then taken and changed to become something that he is kind of, so he is, he's, um, uh, he's protected from the cold. Hmm. Uh, the chair in the middle here is the chair that, uh, that I own as part of my collection. Um, which was coined as Graham's chair because that's Graham. My, that was my cat. He, uh, he passed. He passed about a year ago, um, a few days ago, um, and that's our chair in the kitchen, which was made by Matthew Sims uh, in the eighties. Um, and it's a lovely example of a Jimmy Possum chair. It's got beautiful tool marks, um, and uh, that was you couldn't sit in that chair because Graham sat in that chair. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So that was important. Um, that was important thing to. To want to say that kind of like oh, I've kind of like added added something into the tradition of this as well. Um, so Mike Epworth, um, Dr. Epworth, and what he's been doing as far as um, bringing this forward and keeping it going, he discovered Jimmy Possum chairs in 1986. He was working for a prominent antique dealer um, called the Hoopers, the, the Hooper family, and he saw a McMahon chair, which is one of the McMahon chairs that I showed you, which actually he he now owns, I believe. Um, uh, at the Hooper's home and started making variations of a Jimmy Possum chair himself, being somebody who's a, chair, who's a furniture maker himself. Um, he, interestingly, Mike is from Queensland, but he's part of an eight-generation Australian vernacular furniture making tradition himself. His ancestor was uh, a convict on the First Fleet, and he's recorded in the court documents as making the first piece of vernacular furniture in the country. He made a bed in June of 1788. So it's very, very important what he brings to this as something that is very, very important to him as a maker. His chairs are 12 rung, um, which make them very, very comfortable um, and pro provides us greater comfort. Um, also, Mike's chairs are made from salvage timbers rather than green timber. So we're going back to the red, to the, to the red hill chair, to the green hill chairs and the McMahon chairs. Um, in, uh, he made, if there's an image of it, no, he made a chair that is very similar to this, uh, which is um, no, this one here, close to this one here, that was called the re-examined chair. He made it in 2016 and it was, it was the chair that he made as part of his, his examination uh, for his PhD. 
and it's been, it's been later one of the acquisitions into our collection. This research was an ongoing look at the, the, how important the materials were. So all the materials that were part of his chair, they all had connections to the people who were part of the story. One piece of timber came from the Green Hills, one piece of timber came from, from, um, from Michael McWilliams. Um, they all contributed timber to this chair that held the social fabric of the region. And we actually, and we have a diagram as part of um, collecting that chair that tells us what timbers are what out of all the rungs, out of every single piece. So that we can actually then re, we can show that again to say, this is the fabric of community. This is how important these chairs are. And this is, the, the piece that I write in the, um, in the catalog is about what we've kind of lost in chair making. You're sitting on mass produced chairs, who cares about them? But the Jimmy Possum chair, you look at that and all of a sudden you say, somebody made that, I can tell they made it and it's important. So, um, other, so it's important to say that there's other contemporary makers. Before I, before I move on, there is a Facebook um, a page that is organised and maintained by uh, Mike and Bron called the Jimmy Possum Appreciation Society. That's where you actually see the odd things like this love seat. Um, that people have made as contemporary chairs, but also people discover old chairs that um, were moved between antique dealers during a time when, when um, during the bicentenary, when um, vernacular furniture became very, very popular and the price of these chairs went through the roof, thousands of dollars to make these chairs, or to buy these chairs. What happened was that, you know, unscrupulous um, antique dealers, they would come down to Tasmania and chairs were stolen from people's, people's front yards. Um, you know, oh, your old chair there, you don't care about that, I'll give, you, I'll give you 20 bucks for it, that kind of stuff. Those chairs then lost their provenance and they went to the mainland. So they find, they're finding some of these chairs and there's people that are, and I think there might be some folks here as well that have um, that, that they've discovered that they have a Jimmy Possum chair or they know somebody that's got a Jimmy Possum chair and then I've had more than 10 different inquiries from people that have said, look, I think I've got a chair. And then this one kind of happened through, through that kind of um, uh, connection. This chair is amazing. We have so much provenance about this because we know the National Gallery of Australia bought a chair that was purchased at the same time as this chair. So we understand its provenance, whereas others we don't so much. Um, so other contemporary makers that are, are making, um, there's, so Matt Holden is somebody, um, he's further down south, and what, he, what he's, he's fostering is all of the old traditions of um, making chairs. So it's split timber, it's green timber, but he makes a variety of Windsor chairs, um, Jimmy Possum chairs and other chairs that people can make in a workshop down, down there, which is then fostering this tradition. Every single person that makes a Jimmy Possum chair, which might be 10 or 20 per year or less than that, they are the people that are part of that tradition that will then hand this on, which will proliferate something which is really important in, um, <coughs> in vernacular furniture. The other one which is really interesting is Handmade Matters, um, John Grant. Um, he's doing lots, of, he does commission chairs, but he also does lots of, um, of chair making and stool making uh, workshops um, down south. Um, he very much, his, what he's making is uh, Windsor chairs. He's making them from seasoned timbers um, and he's making some really interesting um, chairs that would fit within, I would say, the American Windsor chair. So the, you've, had the, you've got the English Windsor chair first and then the American Windsor chair is very similar, the comb back chairs, but they are, they're very, very fancy. Um, so he chairs, and he makes one chair that he calls it the, the Democratic chair, which that's, that, that green chair is just a, um, an armless chair, um, a dining chair, but he also makes it with an arm. And they're all hand-tooled um, with draw knives and spoke shavers and those kinds of things. Um, and he's amazing. Um, and that's, and, and that, that kind of bring, brings us to, a, to an end. Um, I wanted to, um, to, to thank these are all the folks that have actually been that have contributed to not only a talk like this but to everything that is about. Um, there's people that collect chairs in this group of people. Uh, Angela Casey who did the photography for the book which is some of the images that you saw. 
a big thank you for um, Dr. Mike Epworth and uh, Bron Harm, um, the Delarone Folk Museum, um, the folks here at QV Mag who have really been great when I've said, you know what, I've, I've, I've got an uncompromising idea around I want how I want this exhibition to be. Um, and I also want to thank the Royal Society for having me here today, which is fantastic. Um, and there's all my references. And the Jimmy Possum, um, we still have, we, it's sold so well, but we still have copies of the catalogue that you can, you can buy today if you'd like. Um, and I also have down here some of those, those books that we were talking about as well, if you want to have a look at those. So those two chairs, those two chair books, this one here, um, the cottage chair book, um, I borrow off and on from my, my partner's um, uh, mother, um, and it sits on the nightstand all the time. It's just kind of like an amazing book. The book on the other side there, which is the book that David was talking about in the very beginning, um, that that book, if that didn't exist, um, the next the next the next chapter couldn't have existed. Um, so it's, it's amazing. And the Jimmy Possum Chair, The Unbroken Tradition, which is this publication, has all the chairs that were part of the exhibition. A lot of the research that I talked about today um, and um, is, a, is an amazing um, way that we're able to bring all those chairs together. Um, so I really hope you enjoyed this and um, it's kind of fostered in you the importance of furniture, vernacular furniture like this because, like I said before, it's really important that You've got a chair like, you know, um, I mean, I get a chance to chance to sit in it now, the grime's gone, but there's a, there's, I sit in that chair every day now. I have a cushion and I have, have a, a, you know, a crochet rug sitting over it and during winter I'm sitting in that chair and I wrote the um, everything and put the, put the everything together sitting in that chair. I thought it was very, very important that I sat in Jimmy Possum chair to put my talk together. Um, so thank you very much. to answer your questions should you have any from the floor and Martin will our technician bring the microphone around. Um, so that's important because not all of us have the same degree of hearing so if you wouldn't be, wouldn't be polite enough just to wait until Martin sort of got to, got to you, that would be very helpful. So any, any, any questions from the floor? Thank you very much for your, your talk. Um, it's, it's wonderful to hear about um, an unbroken tradition, particularly um, chair making, uh, especially in Australia and Tasmania. And what happens, so my question is, uh, I actually have a chair, an antique chair, um, that I acquired in Hobart recently, and I have no idea about the history, uh, its technical design, or who even made it, other than it's a great big hunk of a thing made of solid English oak. But it has, interestingly enough, all of the three principles of some of the earlier pre-Jimmy Possum chairs. What, what, what's the best uh, approach forward? Look, um, I'd be you're quite, you're quite happy to, um, to to get in touch with me. Um, I yeah, I I can can. Um, uh, I've got a, a good history now of being able to identify, you know, certain chairs and um, and, and their makers. But um, they're in Hobart, Hobart would be, even though all of these chairs were, they're very much a country chair. They're very much a farm chair, and they're very much a, um, what do I need to make? I've got I've got the um, um, the materials. I've got the tools, and I need a chair, like like the Green Hill story. You know, I'm a farmer. I've got a wet day. I'm finishing off a chair. Um, you know, we've got some piglets as well. Um, whereas in Hobart, there were uh, a lot of those early Windsor chairs, um, and they've got some amazing Windsor chairs in the collection T Mac. And I've seen some fabulous Windsor chairs in some some of the more stately homes. Um, I went into one house in Battery Point, and they had probably one of the best examples of um, of an Australian Windsor chair because I was told that it was made in Australia. Um, Close to the turn of the century, people, these people have come from Sydney. Um, so there is a, a tradition that is not just Tasmanian. I think it, the, 
the design morphing into what became Jimmy Possum is what makes it interesting. Whereas chairs like yours and others that have a lot of those attributes, they, are, they actually are more, more across the country. Very much in Sydney and Hobart. Um, the early ones that are really, really important in, in their own right. Thank you. Any other questions at the moment? We are going to have a chance to pick Ashley Bird's brains over afternoon tea. So before he decides to step down, one more question. Yes. Thanks very much for, for a very interesting talk. I just noticed that chair that you've got there and a couple in the photographs have got their arms at different heights. Yeah. Um, and you're not going to let me sit on it. You've told me that already. That's but does that not make it rather uncomfortable? Yeah, it does. It's actually it's a good question, Martin. Um, there are many chairs. One of the early chairs that um, Michael donated um, or um, loaned us has got a very, very extreme height difference. The thing is, is that what you're dealing with, um, with the arms on these chairs, you're dealing with something that is kind of like, is, um, is, a, is a long cone. So it's tapered, so that it gets to a point where that taper connects with the, with the, um, with the seat and doesn't move any further. So, so, so what happens with some of these chairs is that when they're actually made as, this would have been made as a green timber chair, that that seat kind of like, you know, on, on the, the four legs, kind of like has a natural spot where it stops based on how he's made those kind of like more conical um, legs. Over time, that changes. So um, sometimes you'll actually see more of one side and the other and it's crooked, or sometimes um, the timber just got to a certain height and he's just cut it off there and put the arm on. So I think that the make-do kind of idea of these chairs has made a few unique ones. The things... And I think Jimmy Possum didn't care so much about how perfect they were, even though there's some that are made better than others. What I've been able to see is that as soon as it crosses over into families like the Larkin family and the McMahon family, all of those, all, everything all of a sudden becomes very, very perfected. Well, not perfected, but very, very much in keeping with something that, um, that you know, you can um, retool and you can change Whereas I think that Jimmy Possum was actually was making these things and then going, okay, it's done, and moving it on. Um, and then really not seeing what, it, what the chair does when all the timber's dry in the season. Mm. So, very much it's organic self-planning. Absolutely. Mm. Any, any last questions? We've got time for one more. Thanks, man. I'd like to know why they all have such short legs. Well, I mean, maybe they were smaller people. Um, but we do, I mean, the thing, the, it's an interesting question. So we do, in, the, in the exhibition, we actually had um, a Jimmy Blossom chair um, that actually, we did, had a little section for modifications. So there was one chair that had been modified where it just, they'd take, you could see where the rung was, they'd take the rung out, they'd gone, this is too uncomfortable, I'm taking the rung out. Um, there's another one where this section, from here and, and here, it's cut away. Um, my feeling, you can't, this, this is what I get from having a Jimmy Possum chair at home, I, if I want to kind of leave that chair, I'm out, I'm out like this, because the arms don't go under a table, whereas if you cut that off, it would go under a table. Um, it, it could be a nursing chair, it could be somebody that likes to play a shillelagh, but it is something that has been modified. Um, the other modification that we had in one chair um, was a chair that was actually about this high. Um, and we and it's got, you can see the remnants of a hole that had been filled in, so it was a commode chair. So you want a little bit more height than that. Um, so, so yeah, so there's, um, a lot of them actually sit at this, at, at this height. Um, and they're kind of, they're more, um, you don't, you wouldn't actually have your knees up, you'd probably have them out, you know. I think that's, it's more of a, a, a comfort kind of thing. Sitting around the fire and kind of like, and having your legs out. So yeah, good question though. Because they do, they do vary. Yeah. People are also taller now. Mm. I reckon, yeah. And if you're older, it's easier to put your shoes on for it, you yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and yeah, they weren't like these things, which are kind of like you know, I just I just put them on in the morning, and, and they're nice and easy. No shoes back then. They were they were elaborate things. So um, so yeah, so you so there is a, a lot of uh, a lot of comfort derived from those kind of things. So, so yeah. 
Sorry, you had a question. Look, um, thank you, Dr. Baird, for um, your most informative lecture. I was born in Yorkshire, and particularly where I came from, we made furniture. My dad and I made furniture as well as other things, but um, we also made lots of other craft items and we went to a craft fair. So the arts and crafts I was born into, and it's been very interesting for me in that respect, from an Australian point of view as well, because I've been here, what David? 38, 39 years, so, but I'm still a Yorkshireman. <laughs> <laughs> so in the Olympics, yeah, Britain comes first, sorry. <laughs> uh, but, um, no, look, um, I'd like to thank you very much because I have just learned so much from a, a Jimmy Possum chair today and it's really very similar to what my uncle used to sit in in Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire and he made his chair. So, yeah, that's going back to the late 1800s Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Yeah. But the thing is, you know, that all these chairs, you know, they're, they're, yeah. they're, they feel like they're late in history, you know? They are, they are, yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, can you please join me in thanking Dr. Baird for such an interesting lecture.